Oh, wow. We're not horrid to nobody. No, we seem like it's your version. Because we're not flattering you. The year of 1966 marked the second phase of the Beatles' career. 1965 had ended with the release of Rubber Soul in December, which coincided with John's father releasing his first single, That's My Life, My Love and My Home. Throughout the year, the group would face public backlash from Lennon's infamous Jesus comments, fear for their lives in Manila after snubbing a dinner meeting, and John would meet Yoko Ono for the first time at an art exhibition. This is the story of the Beatles through 1966. The year began with George and Ringo attending a party thrown by Mick Jagger in London while Paul visited family in Liverpool. A week later, George married Patricia Ann Boyd, better known as Patty Boyd. A few weeks after this, the Cavern Club closed down due to debts of over £10,000. To put it into perspective, that's the equivalent of £92,000 today. In March, the world premiere of the Beatles' performance at Shea Stadium was aired on BBC One. That same month, John was interviewed at his home by Maureen Cleave. The intention had been for the public to get a glimpse into his glamorous lifestyle. As the interview begins, John states his father Fred Lennon turned up at the house a few weeks ago only for John to slam the door on him. He states, He was here a few weeks ago. It was only the second time in my life I'd seen him. I wasn't having him in the house. John then goes on to talk about a cat he recently put that he named after his aunt Mimi. He then takes Maureen on a tour of his Tudoresque mansion which contains a suit of armour, a room of model racing cars and a fruit machine. In John's living room sits boxes of Christmas presents he never got round to hanging out, a massive bible George bought him as a present and a gorilla suit. He tells Maureen all the Beatles were planning on buying gorilla suits and driving around in their Ferraris wearing them. John was the only one who actually did. John states he's an avid reader and has a wide range of books from Huxley, Orwell, Swift and Oscar Wilde. John states, I've read millions of books. He then describes himself as famous and loaded which Maureen later uses at the top of the article. John then plays Maureen some Indian music given to him by George. After 20 minutes, John shouts, You're not listening, are you? This music is thousands of years old. John at this time has been reading obsessively about religion. In a statement that will come back to haunt him, he remarks, Christianity will go. It will vanish and shrink. I needn't argue about that, I'm right and I will be proved right. We're more popular than Jesus now, I don't know which one will go first, rock and roll or Christianity. Jesus was alright, but his disciples were thick and ordinary. It's them twisting it that ruins it for me. When the article is printed in Britain, there is no reaction to John's comments about Christianity. That same month, the Beatles pose for a photo shoot with mutilated dolls and blooded meat. The image was used for the US album, The Beatles Yesterday and Today, released by Capitol Records. In April, recording sessions begin for Revolver and the group give their last UK tour at the Empire Pool in Wembley. That same month, John and George attend a Bob Dylan concert at the Royal Albert Hall. During the second half of his set, as he switches to electric instruments, Dylan is booed by the crowd. During this month, it's reported Alan Klein has placed a bet with a record producer's wife that
that he'll be managing the Beatles before the end of 1966. In June, the group decide to appear on Top of the Pops for the first time. They perform their single, Paperback Writer. It was aired live on BBC One, but afterwards the footage was wiped and thought to be lost forever. In 2019, David Chandler came forward with footage he'd taken of the live performance. The footage you're now watching had lay in a box in David's attic for 53 years. In June, Paul McCartney purchases a dilapidated farm in Kintyre, Scotland. The Beatles then begin a tour of Germany, Tokyo and the Philippines. This tour marked the first time harsh measures were being used to restrain fans. Beatlemania had become so crazy at this point. While in Japan, the group played at the Bidokan, which resulted in death threats as the venue was traditionally reserved for martial arts. From that point on, things went from bad to worse. While in Manila, the group didn't attend a social lunch gathering with the president, Ferdinand Marcos, and all hell would soon break loose. The Beatles carried on blissfully unaware of the storm that was about to hit. The first signs things were amiss was when they performed their next concert and no police escort accompanied them. Exiting the stadium in their cars, they were mobbed by fangs who banged on the glass and shook the vehicles. Back at their hotel, the staff ignored any requests and they received no further security. The Beatles at this point were left to fend for themselves. Fearing for their lives, they would flee to India. On the day of their departure at the Manila Hotel, Paul picked up a newspaper and the headline read, Beatles snub president. They were then forced to surrender their earnings from the shows in Manila, otherwise they wouldn't be let out of the country. At this point, they arranged their own cabs and headed to the airport. On their way, cab drivers seemed to forget the route and when they reached the airport, they were heckled further. The airport manager shut down the escalators and the group were kicked and beaten by an angry mob while waiting to board their plane. The airport manager would later brag about punching them. Neil Aspinall later stated, Nobody got hurt because we didn't fight back. If we had fought back, it could have been very bad. Once on the plane, they were so relieved Paul stated they were kissing the seats. After that, they spent three days in New Delhi before returning to London. The Beatles would never return to the Philippines. In the three days they spent in New Delhi, India, George was able to buy a decent sitar and they decided once and for all to quit touring. The whole time in India, they were careful about what they ate, but ironically, it was on the plane ride back to England they all got food poisoning from a beef stroganoff served. John and Ringo took turns throwing up. Back in London, while the Beatles wrapped up sessions for Revolver, in Southern America, John's comments about Jesus resulted in public burnings of their records. In August, John agrees to star in the film How I Won the War and the Beatles fly from London to the US for their last ever tour. When they arrive in Chicago, a press conference is held where John makes an apology for his Jesus comments. That same month, the Beatles perform their last ever concert at Candlestick Park. Paul requests the concert be recorded on cassette and John takes a camera on stage and takes pictures during the performance. August ends with the Beatles flying back to London and a new era for the band. After that, each of the members embarked on their own individual projects. In September, John flies to Germany to begin filming How I Won the War. John has his hair cut short for the role and is given a funny pair of glasses to wear. He also has his Rolls Royce and chauffeur brought over from London to drive him around. At the same time, George travels to India and grows a moustache at the advice of Ravi Shankar so as not to be recognised. It doesn't work and he and Patty Boyd hold a press conference at the Taj Mahal saying they've come to India to study yoga and sitar. 
Paul, meanwhile, has grown a moustache and is writing a music score for the film The Family Way. By November, John has completed filming How I Won the War and travels back to England. In England, John attends an avant-garde art exhibition and is introduced to the artist Yoko Ono. He was driven to the event in his Mini Cooper by his chauffeur Les Anthony. John, in his own words, looked a state. He had, in fact, been up for three nights tripping on acid. When he arrived at the exhibition, he became very nervous. He kept saying to his chauffeur, I'm not ready yet. Let's just sit here. Let's see what happens. He sat there for 30 minutes and very nearly didn't go in. But eventually, John entered to the usual star treatment he was used to. The attention at this point was exactly what he didn't want. John grabbed a catalogue listing the exhibitions and began looking through. He figured if he buried his head into the magazine, he would not be bothered. After a few minutes, John began looking around the art pieces which he found ridiculous. He began to see the funny side of it and went to view the downstairs gallery. Downstairs, he saw a ladder and something written on a black canvas on the ceiling. John climbed the ladder and grabbed a spyglass which was hanging down and on the canvas was written one word, yes. John later stated, I felt relieved. It's a great relief when you get up the ladder and you look through the spyglass and it doesn't say no or fuck you or something. After climbing back down the ladder, John continued looking amongst a few scruffy people who were standing around. It was at this point he was introduced to a short, pale woman dressed in black. Her name was Yoko Ono. To John, she had a powerful aura. John asked Yoko, Well, what's the event? She didn't answer. Instead, she handed him a card. It had one word written on it. Breathe. Yoko then spoke to John asking if he'd like to hammer a nail into one of her exhibitions for five shillings. John replied, Well, I'll hammer an imaginary nail in and give you an imaginary five shillings. Yoko accepted John's offer. At the same time John and Yoko were meeting, Brian Epstein was publicly dismissing claims two of the Beatles had approached Alan Klein to manage them. In late November, the Beatles meet in the studio. All four have now grown facial hair and are wearing colourful hippie attire. John, who appears thin and gaunt, plays his latest song Strawberry Fields Forever on acoustic guitar for George Martin in little more than a pained mumble. George Martin sat with his arms folded listening and knew straight away the song was a masterpiece. He later stated, I was spellbound. He'd broken into different territory to a place I did not recognise from his past songs. Martin was so taken back by what he'd heard, he later cursed himself for not running a tape. Paul then began writing a song also set in Walton, Liverpool. Penny Lane, George Martin would later refer to as creative rivalry. The newly written songs made Brian Epstein very happy. He'd insisted they release a single by early next year. In December, The Family Way, which Paul wrote a soundtrack for, was released with the yearly Christmas fan club record. On New Year's Eve, George has refused entry to a London nightclub called Annabelle's for not wearing a tie. George is offered one by the doorman, he refuses, and the group he's with see in the new year at a cafe called Lion's Corner House. 1967 would see the Beatles face tragedies, creative blunders and release albums that changed the way music was written. <laughs>